Hello, and thank you for joining us for another episode of Hope for Healthcare with Dr. Katie Cole in partnership with ICD Healthcare Network. Dr. Katie Cole is a holistic physician, organizational well being consultant, and change agent, working with industry leaders and in proven strategies to heal our national healthcare system and our culture of medicine. Stay tuned to hear today's speaker. Welcome everyone to Hope for Healthcare podcast. Today, I want to introduce to you a very good friend and colleague of mine whom I have known for many years, and she's been doing amazing work in the well-being space, Dr. Michelle Robin. She is founder of Small Changes, Big Shifts, Big Shifts Foundation in the Kansas City Wellness Consortium. But more importantly, she is a visionary for the well-being of many generations. After opening her chiropractic practice in Kansas City over 30 years ago, she's become a national influence and memorable leader in the wellness industry. Her simple framework that she calls the quadrants of well-being is the key to what many people have been looking for when it comes to discovering their best life. She has spent the majority of her career helping people make small changes that ultimately create the biggest shifts in their well-being. As a chiropractor, author, teacher, holistic healer, podcast host, an unshakable optimist, international speaker, and passionate advocate for generational change, Michelle has left an impression on thousands of lives by helping them find their unique path to wellness and enrich their purpose in life. Well, welcome, Michelle. Thank you so much for being here today. Well, thanks, Dr. Katie. I sure appreciate the opportunity to share any nuggets that I've learned along the way. Ah. And, you know, it's just such a pleasure to have this discussion with you, Michelle, because I we've known each other. We go way back to, I think, 2010, and uh, we've collaborated on several projects together. And I just am really looking forward to our discussion on um, healing our culture of medicine. So can you tell us a little bit about your background and how you became interested in holistic medicine? Well, it's pretty, pretty simple. Um, I got hurt playing basketball um, in high school by this guy, Wes. Wes actually bumped me into the bleachers playing basketball and it hurt my pelvis. And so, uh, Dr. Katie, I went to the emergency room, small town, Parsons, Kansas, went to Labette County uh, Hospital and nothing was broken. And so with the grace of God, my mother took me to a chiropractor. I happen to know the chiropractor because I taught his kids bowling lessons. (laughs) And I remember absolutely nothing about the chiro, air quote, chiropractic experience from the adjustment but I remember, remember how they made me feel mm-hmm. and they knew that I had uh, some drama and trauma, small town, you know, big town, they know what you go through, small town, they for sure know what you go through. And so they started pouring hope and healing into me. And um, it was a pivotal point in my journey that really helped me, um, I guess, become who I am today. Well, yeah, and I, that must have really informed your path and really opened up your mind to having a holistic chiropractic practice and branching off into that direction. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. Um, I think our path will find us if we're open to looking for it. Mm-hmm. And so when I now that I've, uh, I can look at my life backwards, I can see where uh, my journey just led me to right where I'm at today, passionate about making uh, generational change because people poured into me that has, that's changed my journey and it's changed my journey and it changed my, the twin brother changed his journey, uh, mm-hmm. which changed his four kids journey, which is now changing his grandkids journey. Um, I have two older brothers. Um, it changed uh, some of their kids as well. And some of them actually still struggle, but I were examples of hope and healing and possibilities. And mm-hmm. I believe that's what medicine was designed to be was a place mm-hmm. to give hope and not just in holistic medicine, but every type of medicine. And so, um, you know, Dr. Lakin was definitely uh, uh, just part of my journey that um, didn't treat my mind because of the anxiety. And, and I think that sometimes you don't even know you have anxiety. That's what you're used to living with. Mm-hmm. And um, all of a sudden you start feeling a little bit of peace and you're like, oh, wait a minute. I want that. It's kind of like you're used to living with headaches. Patients come in and say, I got the normal headaches. I'm like, what's a normal what? headache? Yeah, you're that's not, not designed normal. to have headaches. So I've, I've got the normal digestive problems. I'm like, well, that's not normal either. And so I think we have become a little bit, um, oh, jade is not the right word, but jaded could be the right word, that we just have lost touch with how good we're supposed to feel. 
And Dr. Lakin started teaching me that. So I learned that I didn't have to have menstrual cramps and he did acupuncture on me. And he was teaching me to read books on positive thinking. And this was my chiropractor teaching me this. Um, they became part of my family. I'm looking to the right. I'm in my own studio where I do my podcast. And I've got a, a board over here with some of my mentors' pictures, as well as I've got um, a, a, a sign that says, your vibe attracts your tribe. And so I believe he helped me change my vibration yeah. from uh, a fear, fear-based, even though I'm still fear-based, but I don't act on it as much. Also realizing that I was worthy. I think so many people don't think they're worthy of being well, whatever that looks like to you. And so he started teaching me that and I'm forever grateful. I've got his, he's deceased, but I've got his wife, uh, his picture right up there uh, of a recent photo together. Well, and I'm, you know, I'm just curious, Michelle, that, you know, when you start to embrace the holistic lifestyle and medicine, and, you know, I'm an integrative medicine practitioner as well, as I have so much respect for the work that you're doing. Um, you mentioned that people don't know how good they can feel. And I think when you initially have an inflammatory response, whether it's in childhood, teenagehood, young adulthood from something, it could be an injury, an accident, and you don't know how to heal that inflammatory response, it kind of embeds inside your body and your mind, and it becomes part of your baseline of what you think your health is. And that forms, helps to develop and form your personality. So I think when you have that, something that awakens you like you did, and I had an experience too in Kansas City that awakened me. And I was like, wow, I've been carrying around this inflammation for decades, like, and it's not my baseline. And when you have that experience, it's so empowering. Can you tell me a little bit about how you teach others, whether it be healthcare employees, your patients, your clients, more about this holistic approach to healing and a growth mindset? Well, sure. I, I, I believe that um, I really buy into the philosophy that we were designed to be well mm-hmm. and that the power that made us uh, has the power to heal us. Mm-hmm. And how do we get back to that innate intelligence, that inside knowing of what thoughts we should be having and what foods we should be putting in our body and what type of motion we need. And, and as a chiropractor, I feel so lucky to have had this profession pick me. I believe it picked me. Um, and because my best friend in high school's dad was a, a DO um, and he actually offered to pay for me to go to DO school. Um, and, you know, to be honest, I didn't want to let Dr. Lakin down. I, now that I look at it deeper um, and I'm just so glad that I picked this route. And I, I have the utmost respect for every type of physician and healthcare provider, because I don't think people realize what we go through. And so to everybody listening today, because I know it's a lot of healthcare people, um, you know, I get what it's like to thank God that I make the best decision for that patient. Yeah. Um, I get what it's like to, to lose sleep over, um, mm-hmm. whether it's patient care or you, you, you knew you were distracted that day and you didn't want to be distracted, but you know, we all have life happening around us. And sometimes it's the best we've got and we know it's not our best. Mm-hmm. And so the same is true for our body. If you could imagine a snapshot of you feeling vibrant and alive and, and feeling whole, um, you know, my definition of well-being, Dr. Kate, is where your mind, body, spirit don't get in the way. Mm. Um, and well-being in the dictionary is happy. It's hard to be happy when you have a headache or you have anxiety or you've got your back hurting or you're, you can't, you're worried about eating because you're going to have uh, irritable bowel syndrome. And so for me, I love teaching and I've got a picture behind me. For those of you that can see, there's a picture behind me. Uh, it's called the Quadrants of Wellbeing. And, and um, I also, I had Dr. Lakin who really started pouring the chiropractic. I'm not sure he ever poured philosophy into me as I think about it, but I just was around the positive energy, which I so desperately needed as a young person, like a lot of young people do now. And that's why people become doctors and nurses. If you ask, ask most people in healthcare, they had a positive experience with somebody um, that, uh, that helped shape who they are today. And so I think we got to go back and remember that. Sometimes we forget that because we get into the grind of trying to pass a test or, or trying to, we're working so many hours trying to uh, fill the gaps and care for people. And then we're trying to learn about maybe it's all the pharmacy, all the, are the medications. And then we have the, the legal side of it that are we doing this because we think it's the right thing. Are we doing this to CYA? So there's so many things like that, but I got introduced after Dr. Lakin, I um, came to Kansas City to go to chiropractic college. Um, I knew one family when I came here, um, happened to be oddly enough, my first business mentor. Um, the reason why I met the Lakins, they own the bowling alley. That's a whole nother conversation. <laughs> but I, um, there was a speaker that came to the chiropractic college, Dr. Richard Yenny. And Dr. Yenny is from Independence, Missouri. 
And he, as a young boy, was fascinated with the Asian lifestyle. So he knew Mandarin, he, he, could, he could write the calligraphy, and um, he actually was Irish American, but I'm looking at his picture on my wall as well of his 80th birthday. And um, he actually started to look Asian, even though he was Irish American from uh, a small town in Missouri. But um, he was so fascinated with that he started, that he owned judo studios. But he also was President Truman's interpreter. And so when he was over with President Truman um, in Asia, he got hurt playing, doing judo. And so he went to the hospital and they did acupuncture on him. And so he came back to Kansas City um, and he, the closest thing to acupuncture was chiropractic. We have a legacy chiropractic college in Kansas City. They're celebrating 100 years this year. And our profession is only about 100 and, oh gosh, 47 years old, I think, if I would do my math right in my head that fast. And so, um, so 100 years in Kansas City, Cleveland Chiropractic College, now called Cleveland University, because they also teach other programs. But Dr. Yenny came to speak to us when I was a student. And, you know, Kate, I remember just his passion and his zeal. And so I started shadowing him. And then I started begging his assistant, Pat, who's uh, still in my life. I actually talked to her this week uh, to come to work for him. And I said, I'll do it for free. You know, there's, there's a, a saying, success leaves clues. Mm. And I wanted to be around him. And I actually started working for him. And I um, was able to um, take acupuncture from him because he started teaching. He had been teaching chiropractors acupuncture for years. Actually, he's also teaching veterinarians, started treating, teaching doctors. If you go back to the acupuncture lineage in the States, he's a big part of it. And how lucky am I that um, I attracted him in my life or God had him placed in my life so yeah. that I would learn about the quadrants of well-being. And in class one day, he held up a manila envelope. I don't have it here, but um, I've got a picture of it and, and Pat's going to give me it. But he held up a manila envelope. I'm just going to hold it with something. I have a piece of paper here. And it said four words. It said, I'm on the other side. I've got it, the quadrants on the other side. It said mechanical, and then it said chemical, energetical, psycho-spiritual. Maybe not those exact words, okay, but very similar to those. And I remember that. And it just like went into my soul. And I actually forgot I remembered it until somebody was pulling it out of me. But I started seeing people as this whole person. Mm -hmm. My undergrad, Kate, because my, my um, chemistry teacher, Dr. Yusera, said I probably wasn't smart enough to be a chiropractor. I'm, I'm, I'm not really great at chemistry, just so you know which is okay because it gave me, you know, teachers of fortitude and resilience. And that's what we all need is more resilience, but. Oh, yes. Yeah. Well, we all Michelle, need more actually, I was terrible in chemistry in college and my professor was so grateful that I decided to become a doctor because he said, you have no business going into chemistry. Oh yeah. Well, mine. Yeah. So yeah. as you know, it takes a lot of chemistry to be in any but. type of medicine, whether it's chiropractic, osteopathy, or um, <laughs> naturopathic medicine or a medical doctor, but but my, so my undergrad's in accounting and business. And so that's actually what my four-year degree was in. And um, as, as a business person, we look at your body like um, in four, four areas, operations, mm -hmm. marketing, finance, and leadership. And you can't mm -hmm. run any institution without those four areas, right? You can have this phenomenal um, medical care, but you mm -hmm. don't have patients. Mm -hmm. You can have patients and you have not good medical care and you're not delivering on the promise. And you can have phenomenal medical care and you can have patients, but you're not well led by a leader that really gets the vision of what we're doing or exactly. you don't have the financial resources. And so the body's the same way. It, it's got this mechanical aspect, which as a chiropractor and, and you get it too. And I, I think everybody would agree the nervous system plays a big part mm -hmm. of living. And, and I always say we're neurosurgeons that don't cut on people as chiropractors. And so there's the mechanical aspect, mechanical aspect of keeping your spine aligned so you can feel your divine is what we like to say. And then you have the chemical aspect with, as you know, that the nervous system works because of chemistry. So people always say to me, Michelle, why do you care about me drinking water and what I'm eating? Because I can't help keep your spine in the line if you're putting the wrong fuel in. Exactly. And then, then the energetical quadrant is, um, it's, it's this fascinating medicine right now. I think it'll be some of the biggest things we study around the Chinese medicine philosophy. I would tell you in our center, we get more new patients for acupuncture than we've ever gotten this last six months than we've ever gotten. Um, and people are just searching for answers and, the, and they're going back to that. So it's the, the chi, the life flow. It's the energy you get from your devices, the EMFs, things like that. And then of course we have the psycho-spiritual side, which is one of your expertise is what are the thoughts you're having and how do you uh, regulate them or how do you co-regulate them? And do you believe that there's something greater going on? And, and I find people that have no belief system that there's something bigger going on really, really struggle. And so what are you doing to really take care of your mind? And so 
I look at the body much like a business, and um, we are in this business of, of medicine, and um, we've kind of lost our way. We we certainly have, Michelle, and it, and it's been we've been slowly losing our way over the past 100, 150 years. So getting away from the holistic mind body approach to healing and just general quality of life. Um, I'm curious to, you know, you do a lot of work with corporate organizations and healthcare organizations on employee well-being. What are some of the, the key initiatives that you talk with them about so they can promote employee well-being? You know, it's really interesting. That's a great question. I've really started to find my lane. I think that so many times we're trying to be things that we're really not. And my lane really is around the quadrants and the small changes, big shifts movement. So um, we teach them about sleep and about posture and about um, energy, how like freeing your space, mind, body, spirit, because we'll have, we'll have things in our heart that keeps us from doing what we need to do. I mean, you're probably like me. Um, health is really not that hard. You know, we insist on making it complicated, but you know, if you put something in your body and it reacts, you probably should be putting that in your body. If you're around people and you have a reaction, you probably need to figure out that relationship and either heal it, reveal it, heal it, forgive it, or, you know, stay, keep a distance. And so what I do with corporations is really try to help them help their people embody these simple steps, the simple framework so that they can live their best life. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I, I'm trying to, you know, sometimes you start doing other things. You're like, you know, Michelle, quit doing that. This is what you do. And if they don't want what you do, then you need to find somebody who does. But the thing I'm the most um, probably gifted at is the really small changes because, you know, I'm not the smartest pack in the box, but you know what? I will love you about as well as anybody can love you. And sometimes when you start to love yourself, then you will say, you know what? When I drink water first thing in the morning, I mm -hmm. feel better. Mm -hmm. When I turn off my device, I sleep better. When mm -hmm. I quit having caffeine late in the day, I sleep better. Mm -hmm. When I don't talk to that person that gets me agitated at eight o'clock at night, I sleep better. Mm -hmm. um, so we start to really listen and dial in. So I think my biggest um, thing I do with corporations, I try to get them to listen to what their body's trying to tell them. We call it body talk. Your body's always talking. Are you listening? Yes. Well, and, you know, in the holistic and integrated medicine world and the spiritual medicine world, you know, we've been trained and taught how you know, we're human, we're spiritual beings having a human experience. And so it's a, it's a balance and we co-create with our bodies. So if your body is struggling with something, then it's going to affect how your mind is working today. So being really having more of a partnership with our bodies can really, I think, create a more flowing life and give us feedback in terms, like you said, like if we're surrounding ourselves with a toxic situation or work situation to really figure out what direction we want to take. Yeah, I think, and I think, and, and to add to that, I think it's learning yeah. to let go. Oh. You know, I have a saying that's, that I had a few years, it's actually downstairs. It says in the end, it will not matter how, what you learned or yeah. how well you lived, it'll be how well you learn to let go. And so I think it's letting go of maybe people that um, you've perceived a disappointment with mm -hmm. and whether it's a parent or whether it's a, a spouse or maybe it's a child. Um, so I, I'm going to tell you the words that go through my mind pretty frequently throughout a day is let it go frozen. <laughs> so, <okay. laughs> One of the so, best songs ever, right? <laughs> yeah. Let it go. And it's like, okay. And it's uh, kind of become the joke, but that's kind of my mind because is it going to matter three or four years from now? Probably not. It may even not matter three or four minutes from now, but I think as healthcare providers, um, I think we have to look at ourselves. Am I doing everything I can to be the best example of what it's like to be well? For me, that is my ultimate job is how do I walk the talk but I'm not the five letter F word. Um, I'm not sure if you've heard of the five letter F word. No, actually I haven't. Fraud, fraud. Okay. You know, and so I believe that um, it's like having a coach who says, you know, I, you know, I played basketball and the coach would say, oh, don't be out late at night drinking or whatever and smoking. And then the coach is drinking and smoking, right? And so we all want to be surrounded by people that live their values. Mm -hmm. And for me, as I'm in my, hard to believe fifth decade, getting close to my sixth, dec sixth decade and been in medicine um, since I was like 15 years old around this type of lifestyle. I just want to be the best version of me so that when I walk into a room or on a stage or have a conversation um, with a friend that I'm being authentic. Mm -hmm. 
<coughs> excuse me, I'm being authentic and I'm not um, beating myself up. Uh, you know, I, you may know we, we joke a lot of times about French fry Fridays because I love French fries. Um, I did not have any yesterday because I'm kind of on a whole 30 right now. But um, mm -hmm. I think it's important to think about how do you, how do, how can you be authentic? And I think that we have been, if I could be bold enough to say, we have been working for the insurance companies and not for the patients. And most of us, it doesn't feel good. And so we're not in integrity. Mm -hmm. And when you're not in integrity, you drink more, you act out more, you, um, maybe overindulge in food or sex or whatever it is. I think the question that we should be asking ourselves in medicine is, am I in full integrity? Well, that's a great question, Michelle, because that is really foundational, right? We know through what we've been studying and looking at with human capital metrics that when people feel that they have a sense of belonging and that their work is in alignment with their organizational values, it's a much better fit. Um, as a healthcare employee and just a general employee. And so I, I really like what you said about that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. It would have been an easier decision, but it's kind of like you, when you know better, you do better. Um, and as I mentioned, a lot of people, if they grow up in trauma, because a lot of people grow up in trauma, you're just used to um, always feeling anxious. That's normal. And when it's quiet, you're like, what's going to happen? What's going to mm -hmm. happen? Whether she's going to go. And that took me a long time to learn. But now that I'm, I'm like, okay, wait a minute. This is actually how it's supposed to be. Yeah. So I think, this, I think, you know, the question is, is how do we shift healthcare? I think we shift ourselves and we get more in alignment with who we are and who we were designed to be. Mm -hmm. And so let's say for a healthcare employee that's talking to you, like me, a decade ago, Michelle, I came to you for advice, feeling burned out in healthcare. And you, how, how did you advise me or how would you advise someone in that state to create, to be more empowered and to create healthier circumstances around their current position? Well, I don't remember how I advised you. People always say to me, do you remember I had this, somebody <laughs> shot me to me. I, I remember you came and talked to my group and you mentioned this. Do you remember that? And I'm like, no, not really. Um, you know, that's part of the, part of his age and part of it is just, um, you know, getting an opportunity to, to <laughs> interact a lot. So I think if you came to me today, um, and, and I do have people, I'm actually having a couple calls with some people today that are in healthcare. I would say, um, find out where your gaps are in your own wellness first. Mm -hmm. And you may need to hang on to the position you have because I don't want you to starve. I don't want you to not pay your pay for your kids. And, and you have to, sometimes you slowly close the gap. You know, there's where you are and where you want to be. And it's uh, hard to go like this. It's hard to shut that gap that fast because if you're not right with yourself, it's hard to be right with the world. Um, and, and in my case, you know, I was 31 years old, Kate, you may not, may or may not know this, so I was 31 years old, I had a million dollar practice. I was succeeding on the outside and I was dead on the inside and I was praying. I was actually praying, God, if this is all there is, please get me out of here. And I remember reaching out to my then minister at the time, Mary Elmwick, who's also on my board, by the way. And, um, and so I don't know what to do. She goes, well, you have no joy because I was trying to find joy in other people. So I had to go in and I had to do the work. I had to go to do some more therapy. And I did something called the Hoffman process. Yes. Seven day intensive that really helped me get more in alignment and had me start to build compassion and forgiveness for my mother for the um, trauma growing up, you know, because I, unless I healed that, I would never feel okay and feel incongruent with the message I was sharing. And mm -hmm. so I think that's the gap you've got to start to close um, so that you can have compassion and understanding, and then you can have that for yourself mm -hmm. or the other way around. You probably would um, change that um, based on your experience. So I would say the first thing is look at where the gaps are. And if you've cleaned up all the gaps and you feel like, you know, I've done my work and I'm working for a company that is not in alignment with my values, then you start to look now. I think now is a perfect time because people have, have woken up. Um, thank God for the pandemic mm -hmm. and the political crisis we're in. And the mental health crisis we're in, people are starting to say, wait a minute, that's why we've seen this great resignation. Um, and people are starting to say, okay, what really matters? And so I would say, be the type of person that people want to be around, but you've got to be that first and you've got to be, want to be around yourself. Mm -hmm. That's very powerful, Michelle. It's a very, very powerful message. And, you know, as a psychiatrist and, and a mental health champion myself, you know, the it's the work is an inside job. It's an internal job. 
And I completely agree that, you know, we know that 80% of the drivers of burnout are system factors, less than 20% is due to individual. But in my own personal experience with your help and advice <laughs> over a decade ago, you know, I really closed the gap and I worked on my own perspective and I developed more of an empowered approach to my work environment. And I got myself into leadership training and really became a healthier advocate in healthcare. And it changed my life in healthcare. And yes, I still work on the front line for a hospital and I'm in the ER and there are toxic factors to the environment for sure. However, my research, my response to them has improved over the years and I no longer take the stress home and it no longer affects my body and caught, you know, triggers migraines or whatever. And so I really think when you do the inside, the internal work, it really does help shift your perspective and bring joy back into your life. Well, and if I could add, I think it gives you resilience. Yes. You know, I've been playing with that word a lot just recently, you know, like we, during the pandemic, um, mm -hmm. you know, I, what my, my tagline on my show used to be small changes, big shifts, put the odds in your favor. Yes. You know, it's like we put our seatbelt on, we put, you know, we put the odds in our favor, we put our seatbelt on. If we have an accident that we live through it. Mm -hmm. And if I put the odds in my favor, I drink water, my skin's going to be healthier. My digestion is going to work better. If I eat more vegetables, then I'm going to have more vitality and um, et cetera. And so um, during the pandemic, you know, it was a pretty stressful March of 2020, being a leader of a, of a wellness center. And you think about, okay, what do we do? Do we, you know, we're valuable. We're, we're not frontline workers like the people at the ER. Thank God for, for the people that do that. Thank you so much to all your listeners that are, are serving. Um, however, we were serving, the, we were serving the first responders with chiropractic and acupuncture. We were not doing massage. But the words I would woke, wake up to with my spirit saying, Michelle, you've got to find a rhythm mm -hmm. to have resilience. And it just was hounding me, rhythm, resilience, rhythm, resilience, rhythm, resilience. And um, over the last six months, I've been hearing resilience, resilience, resilience. And, and what you just said to me, Kate, what I heard was you developed resilience mm -hmm. because you were not depleted. And so you're able to go into a, a, an environment that um, at this moment in time is more toxic than we'd like, but mm -hmm. it's got to have healthy people in it to create an untoxic environment. So yeah. if all of all the healthy people leave, we're, we're in more trouble than we are right now. But if we Good can point. bring the best version of ourselves and be resilient and go in there and give hope and give some direction and guidance, that's what's going to change the system. But we have to have our own resilience so that we could live through the toxicity. Yes. And, you know, Michelle, one of the things I want to briefly touch on with you, because resilience has been a bit of a trigger word lately, especially the past year, because nurses, docs, people on the front line are saying, you know, we are the most resilient group of people. You know, we've been through decades of training and, you know, long work hours. We are resilient. It's, you know, it, it's not a resilience problem. It's a system problem, which I agree with. However, what I find is the word resilience, there are different definitions of it. And what I'm hearing you say is more of a whole mind body resilience perspective, right? Yeah. I, yeah. I don't, I don't have that perspective. So I'm glad that you're sharing that with me. Cause like I said, I've been yeah. wrestling with this word of how to, how to yeah. best embody it and teach it. And so I believe the years and the decades of not eating right, of not sleeping right, they've taken down our internal resilience. Mm. Okay. And so um, it's not that we are not, you know, we can do it. We can power charge through it. Through. Exactly. We charge through it. We charge through it. We charge through it. And anybody that charges through it over and over and over, they're going to lose some of that internal ability to stay well. Mm -hmm. Maybe, maybe resilience is the wrong word, but I know for me that when I eat more vegetables, I'm more resilient. Mm -hmm. When I am around the right people, I'm having this conversation with you right now, you are building up my res re resilience factors. Awesome. I'm learning from you. We're having a heart to heart exchange yeah. um, and we're both learning and that builds resilience. Mm -hmm. But when I am, you know, not sleeping and I'm eating French fries every day and, and going for um, caffeine too late in the day because I stayed up too early, then all of a sudden I, it, I lose my, my well-being mm -hmm. uh, nest, you mm -hmm. know, if that's even a word. Um, so um, I'll, I'm going to, I'm going to continue. As you can see, I'm going to wrestle with it now based on what you said, because I really, uh, I hear you. Um, but I, I believe that for me, um, when I have been the sickest, 
but no one probably noticed it because I'm healthier than the average person, but I'm not as healthy as I was designed to be. And that's the problem. Is yeah. We take, we take operating at 80% that you're, you're great. Well, you know what? No, there's 20% that I'm leaving on the table that I was designed to have of well being. Exactly. Well, I think that I really love how you defined resilience today in this discussion. And I'm definitely going to post a separate, um, I think, tidbit on this because resilience may not be completely the right word because I don't think it encompasses everything that we were talking about. Um, however, what I'm hearing you say is the internal resilience is, is, what we tend to, we don't have training in how to develop that, even in me medical school and nursing school. And, you know, the, the way that we're trained in resilience is just push through it. You have a 16 hour day in surgery, you're going to stay on your feet and you have one break and you're going to push through it and you're going to do this day after day. And that's the kind of resilience that we're trained in. But the kind of resilience you're talking about is really one that embraces self-compassion and self-awareness and body awareness. And self-care. And self-care. And self-care. So, so think about it like this way. If we were a race car driver, and we were driving our car around the track and around the track. What do they do? They change the tires, right? Mm -hmm. They know we're going to have to change the tires, but um, we're not taught, by the way, you're going to stand for 10, 12, 16 hours a day. Make sure you invest in good shoes so that your feet don't hurt. Mm -hmm. um, oh, by the way, that if you start the day uh, with caffeine, you're going to want to crave more caffeine. And it just creates a vicious cycle instead of, you know, hydrate. I'm not against caffeine, but you know, how do you, how do you fill yourself up? And if you do that, you know, two weeks in a row, you're going to, you're, you're going to suffer and you may have to do it two weeks. Two weeks. So God, we've seen it. Have we seen it when people are on the end of life, how the caregiver just steps in there and they're able to, you're like, how are they still going mm -hmm. night after night after night of staying up and caring for their loved one? And then let's say their loved one passes and, and then they go into this crisis. Mm -hmm. um, so we are, a, we're, we're such a resilient species because we were designed to be resilient the way you're talking about it. I'm talking about this, this cup that um, I'm able to give for my overflow. Can you imagine if all the physicians said, you know what, I'm here today and I'm giving for my overflow because I'm not depleted. And the problem is we're depleted. Wow. Yes, that is, it, that is a global problem, actually. Yes. Well, I, Michelle, thank you so much for deep diving into the quadrants of well-being and kind of sharing with us some of the highlights of what you teach for corporate and healthcare well-being. I really appreciate that. And I know um, you wanted to touch on today, I think that you created the Wellness Con Consortium in Kansas City. Can you tell us a little bit more about that and how you are creating a fabulous resource for patients and clients um, to, to seek out? Yeah, Kate, first of all, um, thank you. I'm humbled to be your friend, um, especially oh. so many people think that um, MDs and DOs and chiropractors can't be friends. And we know that's oh, not the truth. That is not the we're, case, we're human beings having the spiritual experience and we align with what our assignment is. I believe that you're doing your assignment as well. Um, and, the, and the other thought is people are thinking about it, if you, if this resonates with you, I'm happy to gift any of your listeners, my e-factor book that um, I wrote in 2012, that talks about kind of, I'll send you the e-version if they just email me at Dr. Michelle at smallchangesbigshifts.com, Dr. Michelle at smallchangesbigshifts.com. I'm happy to send it to you. Um, and it talks about three things. It's called, it's called um, engage. It's called the e-factor engage. Oh my goodness. It's called the e-factors, three steps to vibrant health, engage, energize, enrich. Mm -hmm. And, um, and we talk about the quadrants in there and we talk about the wheel of support and that's where the consortium comes in. Um, and we talk about when you, really get energized in your own well-being, you start to realize um, that everything around you is energy. And then you figure out how do you enrich other people. And that's what you're doing. You're saying, you know what, I've, I've had the privilege of, of deciding that I'm going to look above and not through, or maybe through and above and try to figure out how do I be a solution to this problem instead of bellyache over here about it and say it's broken. Let me try to do something about it. That's why you have this fabulous podcast. So I'm, I'm delighted to give that but it talks about the wheel of support. And what I've learned is no one goes alone. As I told you, I've got this board over my right here. And once again, it says your vibe attracts your tribe. And so I'm responsible for walking into a room and bringing more than I take. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so over here, I've got, like I said, I've got mentors, I've got friends, I've got my family 
um, that have poured into me and I owe them um, to pour back in other people. Mm-hmm. And one of the ways I like to do that is by in, uh, investing in our wellness community in Kansas City. We're also looking at other communities right now, um, looking at Atlanta and Tampa and in Denver. But how do we help providers come together around a common framework? Because mm-hmm. I would believe that most people, no matter what you're in, if you're in, even a dentist, can believe that you got to take care of your teeth from a whole perspective. Uh, or whether you're a psychiatrist or whether you're a, a, a wellness coach or whether you're a personal trainer, that we, that as wellness people, we probably all believe we just need a simple framework. And I'm happy to share that with anybody who wants to talk about it, because I believe that's what I'm here to do on the planet. So we have something called the Wellness Consortium. It's a consortium of people that have come together to try to help each other. Um, we, we have three principles, build, connect, support. How do we help build them, connect them, and support them? Because people want to maybe step out and be more holistic, but they're not sure they can survive on it. And what's so great right now is the community is, the, the world is saying, I want a different way. Mm-hmm. I don't want to just take a bunch of pills for my anxiety. Um, I'm okay taking pills. I'm not against that. But I also wanted to do some other things to help my anxiety. Oh, I need to exercise. Oh, I need to think about doing some meditation. And so this group is just collaborating. And, and we have four rules. We are, once again, our goal is to build, connect, support providers that are like-minded, um, just like you know you and I are like-minded. But we do it through kind of four ways. We, we show up. And I believe that when you called me and said, would you show up for me? I'm like, yes. Just like when I called you in 2018, when I was having my 25-year anniversary of celebrating well-being in Kansas City, I said, would you speak to my audience um, so that they know that we're, A, we're in alignment because you're giving some new ideas about how to think about mental health. Mm-hmm. Um, as you may remember, I had four suicides of my personal patients that year. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so leading up to that event. So it's super important what you had to share. So you got to show up, but you got to show up for yourself first. And um, I say my biggest decisions every day is the right yeses and the right noes. Mm-hmm. Um, but then the second thing is you want to be a go-giver is how, what can I, can I go into a conversation thinking about what can I give you without expecting anything in return. And that ties into the kindness campaign that we're in, uh, in the middle of right now. Um, and the third one is celebrate each other. You know, you're celebrating my work. I'm grateful for that as I celebrate your work. Um, and, at the other, and it's also do one-on-ones. The only way you get to know somebody's heart is you actually um, visit with them, whether it's through a walk or it's through a meal and you start to hear each other's story. And when you hear each other's story, you can build compassion. Um, so that's the wellness consortium, um, find it small changes, big shifts.com right hand corner, uh, green button wellness network. Um, and eventually consu- consumers want people like you and I, mm-hmm. um, and we've got to find a way for them to find us so that, um, it truly is a network. There's something about being in a group of people. It's, let's, let's take a, a network, a provider network. Let's say like United healthcare, they have a provider network, but they have no relationship with each other. So here we're trying to provide a community, but at the same time, we're trying to build relationships. So when I say, by the way, you should go see um, my friend, Brooke, who happens to be a nutritionist and a therapist, and I think your 18-year-old daughter will absolutely love her, people will say, well, you personally know her? Yes, I, I can call her right now on my cell phone and say, hey, I'm sending you this person. Mm-hmm. I know you'll take great care of them. When you have a relationship like that, there becomes an accountability. Mm-hmm. And the accountability is, I don't want to let Dr. Kate down right? And people deserve accountability and they deserve an advocate. And the way you do that is by having relationships. And so um, I'm extremely passionate about it. And I tell you, I'll spend the rest of my life working on building providers to help, first of all, get well, to walk the talk, but at the same time, build connections so that we build accountability, not to the insurance companies. We build accountability within our wheel of support that you can trust the referral I'm going to give you. And if and if it's not a fit, I tell them, let me know. If it's not a fit, I got three more people in line. But right now, this moment, my spirit's telling me that this is the right person for you. So that's what we're doing. Thank you so much for asking about it. Yes, I'm so excited about your consortium. And it really, you know, the process you describe in terms of um, holding each other accountable by having these relationships, that is what shifts our culture of healthcare and medicine. So, so I'm really grateful that you touched on that today. Well, thank you for asking. Well, Michelle, I know we've, we, it's been a very heartful uh, discussion today. Is there anything else that you want to highlight for our audience today that I didn't ask? Well, well Kate, you, you know, I'm a, I'm a big person on, on kindness. And um, as we've been walking through 
the last couple decades, especially the last few years, we realize that we are in a mental health crisis. And you know that more than anybody with your background. And as you know, the research shows that when you're kind to yourself, okay, and you're kind to others, it changes your brain. Mm -hmm. And it releases those fancy neurotransmitters that you probably mm -hmm. know more about than I do, serotonin, dopamine, and um, tocin and all that stuff. And yep. oxytocin. And <laughs> so um, we're in the middle of a kindness campaign right now and trying yeah. to encourage people to um, just be more kind. They can find out more about it at our foundation, bigshifts.org backslash kindness, because I want our kids to grow up in a kind world. Um, I, I, I know you've seen this when people come in and they say they were bullied at the age of 10 and they're still talking about it at the age of 50. Mm -hmm. That's a problem. It the is. problem is they got bullied in the first place. The second thing is, as a healthcare system, we couldn't get them to shift out of that, but it should never happen in the first place. So, so, Hey, just be kind to yourself. And I, a lot of people are struggling right now. I just invite you to just take a breath, um, give yourself grace where you're at, look at the gap and take, think what's the next one step, not the next 10. What's the next step I can take to be the best version of myself? Well, that is a perfect way to end for today, Michelle. I, I love how you wrapped everything up into kindness. And uh, everyone, thank you so much for tuning in today for Hope for Healthcare. Dr. Robin has been very generous in providing so much information. And I think she's going to offer her E-Factor book if you send an email to her. So we'll make sure that we have all that information available on our bio page and we'll be posting on social media. Thanks, Kate. Yes. Thank you, Michelle. Heart to heart hugs. Heart to heart hugs. And thanks for being here today.